thank you very much. Um, I, this, is, this is a really fascinating story, so I hope I don't drag it down to the level of something that, you know, is a basic terrible presentation of some sort, but um, it's, just, it's, just, it's just rich, and it's really an honor to be here at the Public Library. This is the 50th anniversary of the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense, so any of you Panthers that are out there, you're original Panthers, as you know, are at least 52 or 53 years old, I suppose, or maybe, maybe, even, maybe even a little more. Um, so it's a pleasure to do this presentation, which is really only a footnote in the rich history of the Panthers, um, but it also includes some great biography of two really fascinating photographers, and it dabbles in counterculture history as well as the history of photography and the politics of a um, major San Francisco museum. On December 1st, 1968, visitors to the Young Museum viewed the final day of a show titled Hey Ashbury, 1967. And these were Ruth Marion Baruch's photographs of the Summer of Love from the, from the previous year. The following Saturday, you could walk into that same museum out the DeYoung and you could return for the opening day of a photographic essay on the Black Panthers, which was a collaboration between Ruth Marion Baruch and her husband, Perkle Jones. These are two really, as everyone knows, defining moments of 20th century American cultural history with their epicenters right here in San Francisco in the Bay Area at the same time. Um, and as much as Perkle Jones is really the photographer in many respects that's identified with this, the whole idea and the thing was orchestrated by Ruth Marion Baruch, both exhibitions, the Haight-Ashbury photographs and the Panther essay that they did. This is a photograph of Ruth Marion who was born in Germany. Her father was a neurosurgeon, a distant cousin of Bernard Baruch, one of the richest people in the world. Her mother was from an even wealthier Berlin family, if that's even possible. And although Weimar Germany was relatively hospitable to Jewish intelligentsia at that time, like Ruth Marion's parents, they moved to New York City in the late 1920s because of opportunities as a neurosurgeon. Um, her mother, however, continued to go back and forth between Berlin to live that libertine lifestyle of 1920s and early 30s Germany. And although that early move to the United States protected their immediate family from the rise of Hitler, the Nazis nevertheless confiscated the family's immense wealth and that mansion that they lived in, in Berlin, and members of their extended family perished in the Holocaust. Ruth Marion's father died in New York City while he was being photographed for a photo essay in Life magazine in, in the, probably around 1938. Um, and Ruth was on her own with a trust fund in the, in the States. She winds up going to the University of Missouri as an undergrad where she experiences anti-Semitism. Uh, boarding houses in Columbia, Missouri didn't rent to Jews and so she was like shunted aside and had to find someplace else to live. Um, as a grad student, she moves to Ohio, on to Ohio University where she wanted to um, mingle her love of writing and photography, and so she started a program, in, a graduate program in photography where she receives the very first MFA in photography in the world, first one that was ever granted. Um, and she decides to do her thesis on Edward Weston. Uh, Weston, of course, is this giant in photography. He was Ansel Adams' mentor. Um, she writes to West down on the West Coast and he says, why don't you come and visit me? Come and stay with me here in Carmel and you can get information for your MFA thesis. Uh, she goes out, stays with Weston. He introduces her to uh, Ansel Adams, to Imogen Cunningham, Dorothea Lange, California photographers and artists. You know, and at the same time, Edward is putting to, Weston is putting together these photographs for a show that a big retrospective show of his that's going to happen at the New York Museum of Modern Art. And Ruth Marion poses for Weston. And as you can tell from this letter, this, there's this great correspondence between Weston and Ruth Marion. These love letters, which Ruth kept all those years. And this, the, they're all located now at the University of California, Santa Cruz. And in this one, you can see that this relationship grew beyond writer, subject, and model photographer um, as evidence in this set of letters. And it says, in, in this one, uh, Weston writes, I would prefer to see you alone, or that might be too dangerous. Do you want to chance the couch again? <laughs> and then on the this, on this side, it says, uh, love and kisses on the tip of your finger. 
in this one, you can see this is one of the last of their um, correspondence of their love letters, and it says, um, you know, Ruth Darling, sweet A.B., and that's code for something which, you know, if any of you have any ideas what that could be, it'd be, it'd be interesting. But, you know, he, and he says, you know, uh, we agreed that 60-20 didn't make sense, and I never knew what that meant, but their age is, Weston was 59 at the time, and she was 23, and so that's what, they're, that's what he's responding to. But I'm glad to know that you still have a place for, you, for me in your heart. Um, she learns that Ansel at this time, Ansel Adams, who she's introduced to, is going to start a photography program at the California School of Fine Arts, which is now the San Francisco Art Institute. And she also realizes, after being around Weston and being around Adams and all these people, that she really doesn't know that much about photography, even though she's the one who has the only MFA in photography in the world. And so she decides to go from Ohio University to California to be, enroll in the program at the Art Institute, which begins in, the, in 1946. She um, studies with Ansel, Minor White, Weston, Dorothea Lang, Lizette Modell, Imogene, and the school's where Aperture Magazine is founded, if any of you know that photography magazine in 1952 when Minor White is the editor. And even though this was a remarkable photo program, when you're just seeing that list of people, you, uh, the place was really known for painting. It's where Clifford Still taught, and Richard Diebenkorn was a student and then taught right away, where Mar David Park was, and where Mark Rothko was teaching in two different summers. Um, during her first semester at the school, Ruth Marion lives in Ansel's house, which is out just, uh, it's close to Baker Beach near Seacliff, and he had two houses there, and so she, li she moves in there and lives, and Minor White is living there as well, and uh, this is one of her fellow students who came on the GI Bill, which is David Johnson, and I think he's really important in this story, even though David probably doesn't realize how important that she he was to her because I think it was the very first close friend that she had was African American. David's story is absolutely fascinating. He was a GI Bill student from segregated Jim Crow South. He grew up in some of the worst poverty you can ever imagine. Both his parents and his stepmother were in jail for uh, murder, so he was raised by yet another mother who gave him his last name. Um, he joins the Navy at 17, where he's in the segregated Navy at that time. He comes back, he dabbles in photography a little bit and, and when he's in high school, he, and he sees an advertisement for this school that Ansel Adams is gonna start, and he writes to him and says, you know what, I'd like to be in your first program, is that possible? And Ansel writes back and says, sure, come on out. And then he writes back and says, I'm an African American. And he says, that's fine, come on out. I'll have Minor White meet you at the train station and you can come and live in my house. So David was living in this house at the same time as Ruth Marion Baruch and Minor White because they realized they needed to get David be some better equipment and to bring him up to snuff with the other photographers who were in this program who were all GI Bill students who had done plenty of photography before then and who, um, but David had a sensibility about him where he just clicked. I was hoping he would be here tonight because David's still alive and he's a real, he's a terrific character. Um, so he, he wrote an autobiography and he talks about falling, in, falling down the rabbit hole because all of a sudden he goes from the most poverty stricken place in the world to living out in Seacliff with Ansel Adams and Ruth Marion Baruch. And Ruth Marion Baruch and him connect because both of them had experienced prejudice in their own way, even though Ruth Marion Baruch is the most wealthy person you could ever imagine. And, and David was probably one of the poorest people you could ever imagine. So this program had this crucible of these interesting people. Um, Perkle Jones also came to the school at that time. They were both in the first class. Perkle is here on the right with Ansel in the, in the dark room. Um, he's one of those GIs who came. He grew up in Louisiana and southern Indiana where he witnessed horrific racism. His family members were Klan members and he, they would come home and tell him about lynchings and this bothered Perkle until the end of his life. He would cry when these things came up. So his witness of racism was from a whole different angle than Ruth Marion's, but he understood that this is something that is just absolutely horrific. He was thrilled to be in California instead of being back where he was in the Midwest or in the South. Um, Perkle and Ruth meet in the photo program, fall in love, and then they're married by Ansel up at Yosemite in 1949 at the end, at the end of their program. Ansel was the one I mean, Ansel's an egomaniac, right? I mean, you can tell from this picture, but a wonderful guy who brought in people who challenged him in photography. All these other photographers would kind of look at him, you know, Imogene Cunningham would look at him and frown and think, oh, Ansel, you 
pipsqueak. You don't know anything. Dorothea Lange would look at him and say, you don't know anything about social activism within photography. But he was strong enough to do, to do that. For, what he did for this program was he taught technique, beauty, and really this love of photography. Um, the intellectual force behind it all was Meyer White. And here he, he is shown in one of the studios lecturing to the students. And he was interested in how students would explore the psychological implications within photography, much the same way as those abstract expressionists were wrestling with those same ideas after World War II of you know, the Holocaust and the atom bomb and two world wars in their lifetime. Um, and then Dorothea Lange, who was probably the most it, um, important of these instructors for <coughs> this project for the Black Panther project that Ruth Marion and Perkle do because she's the one who gave them that social responsibility aesthetic to make sure that they were um, that social stance within photography. She'd been a, a photographer during the Depression era, done the FSA photo photographs, done this very famous classic photograph of Migrant Mother. Um, after graduating from the program and after they get married, Perkle goes on to work with Dorothea Lange on a project to document the um, building of the Monticello Dam, which forms Lake Berryessa. And so these are photographs from a series that they did that was published in Aperture called Death of a Valley. And Perkle's photograph of Dorothea Lange as they're cutting down a tree. Um, and then sort of this ecological environmental catastrophe with building this dam and destroying what you know, probably mimicked Napa Valley or mimicked, uh, you know, Sonoma Valley in many respects. And it's sort of, I think it's sort of a highlight um, as one of the very first artists' response into environmental destruction. Like it was some of the first, uh, you know, uh, real take a stance for, uh, you know, the environmental aspect of things by artists, by Perkle and Dorothea. Uh, after she left school, Ruth Mary Brooke continued to photograph. She was um, invited to be in Edward Steichen's show Family of Man, which was one of the most famous photography shows in the 1950s, which you know, brought in all sorts of social documentary kinds of f photographs. Ru one of Ruth Marion's pictures that were in Family of Man that she took here in San Francisco. Family Man installation in New York at uh, MoMA. Um, and then in the early 1960s, she did a series called Illusions for Sale, which I contend is probably one of the very first feminist responses to women trying to buy uh, beauty or buy a culture or, or buy, um, you know, trying to uh, buy an identity through shopping and con consumerism. Um, this show was shown at the um, San Francisco Museum of Modern Art and had this had a great response from reviewers who thought she had great respect for uh, all of the participants, for the women shoppers at the same time. You know, she was not making fun of these women. Perko and Ruth collaborated on photographs about Walnut Grove, California, showing this decaying city that was um, on the Sacramento River. And this is, of course, the beginning of the 1960s. So your 60s, San Francisco, 60s, California. This is the 60s at the Art Institute. Sunglasses, nonchalance, nudity in the courtyard, and drugs, and rock and roll, and the changes in the art world in San Francisco, exemplified by Bruce Nauman, who was teaching at the Art Institute at that time in the mid to late 60s with this piece called Fountain. But the real changes in San Francisco probably were happening over on the other side of town. They were political and cultural, as evidence in Haight-Ashbury. And at the height of hippiedom in the summer of 67, uh, Ruth Miriam Baruch goes to Haight-Ashbury and starts to photograph. She empathized with hippies. She figured that their dropping out was only temporary and that they would truly find their way at some point. Now, this is where people might recognize themselves in some of these images. So if you do, please speak up. If any of you were you know, hanging around in Golden Gate Park or um, hanging around at uh, Defremery Park in uh, Oakland or wherever. Um, the anti-war movement was one of the, those political ingredients in that cultural uh, aspect of Haight-Ashbury. Love. Um, and her timing was perfect. You know, she was there at the highlight of things, and then she was also there at the wonderfulness of everything, and then she was, and then everything sort of comes to an end. It crashes to an end, as illustrated by this uh, 
a denizen of uh, Haight Ashbury who she's on drugs, you know, for bum trips. You know, these were these were first exhibited. These photographs of hers of Haight Ashbury were first exhibited at the Eamon Carter Museum in Fort Worth. Um, where Jack McGregor of the De Young Museum, who was director of the De Young Museum at the time, saw him, and he said, well, we'd love to show those at the De Young. And she said, all right, fine, we'll schedule a time to do it, and they were going to do it in the following fall, in fall of 68. And she, he asked her, he asked Ruth Mary, what would you do next? And she said, well, I would love to photograph the Panthers, but who would show them? And he said, well, we'll show them. And she said, all right, you're on. We're going to show these photographs that I'm going to go do of the Panthers. And her thinking was that she was really upset. She'd been politicized by the early 60s. She's been part of the Peace and Freedom Party in, in San Francisco and Northern California, and now in Marin, where she lived. And she wanted to show that they, how maligned the Panthers were in the, by the media, as, you can, as is evidence from this headline in the Sacramento Bee in a lot of ways. Um, and she wanted to show that they were, had been demonized. And her and Perkle had become lefties and mu very much anti-war and very much pro-civil rights, and they wanted to show this other side. Now, this is the de Young today, but this is the de Young that existed in the 60s and 70s, as many of you still re remember. And it was a very, very different time. Exhibitions and shows were very different than they are now. You know, they, they don't, ha they didn't, uh, somebody asked me at one point, who curated that show? And you realize nobody curated that show. That show was curated by Ruth Marion Baruch and Perkle Jones under the direction of Jack McGregor. And they did it in a heartbeat. They did them all very, very quickly. You know, it was just a different world within the art community at the time. Um, with Jack McGregor's go-ahead, Ruth Marion Baruch went to Kathleen, Kathleen Cleaver, who was giving a lecture in, um, in Marin. And she asked if it would be okay if they went and photographed the Panthers. She suggested, well, you should go talk to Eldridge, who was the Minister of Information for the Panthers. She goes over to Oakland, talks to him, and he has time for her and says, yeah, you can do it. We're have, we have rallies in Defremery Park in Oakland. We're having these free Huey rallies. So again, the timing is absolutely perfect. She's there at the pulse of things, right in Oakland at the time where Huey, when Huey Newton is being tried picture of Bobby Seale speaking at Defremery Park. Ruth Marion Baruch was a crappy driver, and so she had to figure out a way over there, and Perkle was the one who drove, and she said, Perkle, will you drive me there? And he said, I'll drive you, but I'm taking a camera. And so now Perkle's involved with us, and it's a, it's a collaboration. Um, outside of Defremery Park, they would protest each day at the Alameda County Courthouse. They photographed from July through October of 68. And in this image, you see some of the artwork from the Panthers, which is done by a photograph that they have of Emery Douglas, who's here on the left, who's still around and hopefully will be around San Francisco some to give lectures and stuff, um, and a terrific artist to this day. But um, Emery was the Minister of Culture and Revolutionary Artist. And on the right is Barbara Easley at the Free Huey Rally. Who, and I think Barbara Easley winds up taking, is in charge of the Panthers later on, maybe in the by 70 or 71 in Oakland. Um, this is the obligatory photograph that a librarian shows when they're showing the Panthers because it shows two Panthers reading a book. Now, they're, what they're probably reading is, and I love this photograph, the, just the posture and everything is just so perfect. And they're probably reading Mao's Little Red Book, which was on, they were, weren't they? I mean, that was, a, there was a bibliography, whole bibliography the Panthers had to read before they could kind of be anointed. And that was certainly on their, on their yeah, bibliography. The that, that was the Bible of everything. Yeah, the Little Red Book. And, you know, Perkle didn't photograph in color ever, so you're stuck with it looking like that. But that truly looks like the size of it, and that was on their required reading list. Um, this is a photograph of... Uh, Co -found, on the far right is co-founder of the Panthers, Albert Big Man Howard, who's still alive. Um, he's not, he now lives in Sonoma County. Years later, Big Man said that Perkle and Ruth Marion had a great eye for humanity. They captured the real love and inspiration of what the Black Panther Party was all about. He explained that the Panthers came from the community and went back to the community. And that's exactly what he still does up in Sonoma. He still is a community activist. Um, working with different groups and with kids, and he truly does walk that talk to this day of being, you know, within that community and trying to do the things that he was trying to do as a Panther when he was a kid. Women Panthers? Plenty. Um, Bobby Seale. Um, her intention 
as was to not only show how you know the other press had demonized them, but she wanted to show them as they are, you know, not the side that the mass media was done, you know, at, you know, as it was, you know, she wanted to tell it like it is, as they would say in the day. So there are plenty of photographs like this, and these are just photographs at these picnics where they truly are having, you know, rabble rousing speeches, but at the same time they're in in the park with their families. You know, she said, this is what we saw, this is what we felt, and these are the people. And that's how she responded to critics who said, you're not showing any of the violence. You aren't showing the violent aspect of the Panthers whatsoever. And she, you know, that wasn't her intention. She's not, she wasn't, she and Perko were not photojournalists. They weren't documentary photographers. They didn't go out looking for that. They went out to just immerse themselves and embed themselves in the situation, photograph what was around them, and this is what winds up being shown. Um, kids slicing, slicing bread. Um, Peter Coyote saw this photograph, who was a member who's in, of the diggers of the 60s. And when he saw this photograph when they were displayed at the Harvey Milk Center, he said, that is digger bread, because he recognized the shape of it from the coffee cans that they would bake these things in. And so it shows you this really nice connection. A lot of this story really is about the, what was the white radical role in something like the black liberation movement. And Peter Coyote was one of those people who did cross over into that, as did Ruth Marion and Perkle. Um, now, a lot of this stuff was generated by Huey Newton being in jail. This is, um, at one point, Charles Geary, who was the attorney for Huey Newton, uh, called Ruth Mary and said, look, if you want to get a photograph of, of Huey, you better do it right now, because he's going to be shipped off somewhere soon, and you're not going to find him. So they went immediately, and they spent about an hour with Huey, and, and they took these sort of uh, iconic photographs of him right at the end of his trial. Um, the Panthers also had things in Marin. There was a Marin City branch of the Panthers, and so Ruth Marion Perkle also photographed in Marin. I think this is, of course, a Unitarian church where the Panthers were, gonna, um, were doing um, a, a talk in San Rafael. And the Marin City Panthers, a group of Marin City Panthers. In front and center with either Perkle, I can't, don't know if that was a Perkle picture or a Ruth Marion picture. Another picture of um, Marin City with some of, actually that probably has um, some of uh, Emery's art in the background. Um, Ruth Marion and Perkle made all their photographs available to the Black Panther newspaper. So when you go through the archives of those newspapers, you see these photographs that were done by Ruth Marion and Perkle. And Eldridge would take a look at them. He'd say, God, use these things. These are, these are perfect for the, our um, newspaper. And they showed them, they would show these to Eldridge, and he said, Cleaver's response was, why do your photos have a feeling that none of the work I've seen of, of us by other photographs has? So that must have been, you know, this huge tribute to these two white photographers who were middle-aged at the time. You know, thank God, it, it sinks in. Um, this is one of my favorite images of all of it. It just shows the gathering, but what it really shows is Ruth Marion Baruch. photograph of Perkle showing Ruth Marion Baruch taking these pictures. And it's great evidence that these are not young fellow traveler SDS radicals who are, you know, Panther, you know, Panther uh, supporters. These are old, 46 and 53 years old, and that was old back then too. I mean, you're over 30. I mean, that's old, 53, 46 from Marin County. And they're photographing with the pan Panthers, and they're embraced by them. Surrounded. They're surrounded by people. And now, they're surrounded by other people, and some of those other people with cameras probably are FBI. <laughs> and you think, where is that footage? How come that footage has never appeared? And you realize that footage is probably long gone because it was used for other purposes. It was documenting. They, um, Perkle and Ruth Marion finished uh, taking photographs in, 1960, in October 68, um, and it coincides with Ruth Marion Baruch's Haight-Ashbury photographs going up at the De Young, which, it, which happens in, from October to December. Um, but by this time, McGregor, head of the De Young, is starting to get nervous about the upcoming Black Panther show, because he thinks, wait a minute, this could be dicier than I realized. What have I really promised? 
because since the summer of 68, when Ruth Miriam was promised this show, there were anti-war protests in Chicago. If you can conjure up some of that his current the history from that time period, you know the, the um, Democratic National Convention in Chicago. There was Tommy Smith's and John Carlos's Black Power salute in support of Black Liberation Movement at the Mexico City Olympics. A photograph that I've always loved since I was a kid. And it dawned on me as a kid even that they had one pair of black gloves because one guy has the right glove on, one guy has the left glove on. So they traveled light when they went to Mexico City. Um, there were 60, 1968 protests at the same time in Chinatown over the city wanting to, you know, turn it into a, some sort of tourist Disneyland rather than for the people who lived in Chinatown at the time. And then there was San Francisco State in the fall of 68 where there were people went on strike, students went on strike, they tried to, sh they shut the place down because they want one, one of their key demands was to start a black studies department at San Francisco State at that time. And so the cops closed the place, you know, the Daily Gator reports it. San Francisco State, S.I. Hayakawa. And you can tell, you know, it's like the song. Something's happening here. What it is ain't exactly clear. Um, so he's reluctant. McGregor's reluctant to show the, um, to show the Panther photographs. He says, I got to take it to City Hall. Ruth Miriam Baruch and Perkle were completely upset with this. And so they decide, the friends tell them, take it to the newspaper. And so they go to the reporters at the Chronicle. I think they went to probably Alfred Frankenstein, who was our critic at the time there, and other people at the Chronicle. The Chronicle then influences people at City Hall. And the next thing you know, they get a call from Jack McGregor, says, okay, the show's on, because they think it would be more drastic to not show it. If they didn't show it, they thought, what the hell would happen then? So we've got to show it and just suck it up and see what's going to happen. Perkle photographs the installation of the show. All of it was hung by Ruth Marion and Perkle, and Ruth Marion probably did all the captions for it. And all these captions I discovered are at the UC Santa Cruz archives too, so you can go through and see these things. You can see the little pinholes in them too that were on the wall. And 100,000 people come to this show. It opens on December, on December 7th, and 100,000 people attend this thing. It truly is a blockbuster. And then it's extended for two weeks into February. They were, Perko and Ruth Marion, of course, were thrilled at the fact that the attendance was so huge, but they were also thrilled with the fact that people were attentive, as you can see from these photographs. People paid attention. They read those, the, they read the descriptions that um, Ruth Marion had put on all the photographs. Um, and they were thrilled with the fact that African Americans came to the museum, too, as well as many Panthers came to see it. The New York Times reviewed the exhibition. Um, it was reviewed and written up in the Black Panther, news, Black Panther newspaper. And they, they reviewed the show, and, and the characteristic of the time, they, they wrote that the exhi ex exhibit was likely to be the most favorable communication between the bourgeoisie and the vanguard this year. <laughs> so you think, wow, they were really reading that bibliography, weren't they? They were reading their little red book and stuff, and it, and it was perfect. It, it would, and it probably was the case. You know, it was good communication between the bourgeois, best communication between the bourgeoisie and the vanguard. And so, um, you know, and they commend, in the review, they commended Perkle and Ruth Marion for their enthusiasm and sensitivity. And that must have just, you know, tickled them. After the, after the show leaves, uh, after it comes down at the De Young, it's the first photo show at the Studio Museum in Harlem. So it goes to New York City. Um, after it went there, it went to Dartmouth College, which had sense enough to show it, and then it, show, and then it goes to UC Santa Cruz, um, the Studio Museum of Harlem today. At the same time in New York City, other museums were wrestling with the same thing, and the Metropolitan Museum of Modern Art did a show called Harlem on My Mind, Cultural Capital of a Black America, and it didn't do so well. People, uh, it did not include the black artists of Harlem. It didn't include any black photographers. It didn't include curators who were putting this thing together. It was, it was just minimal, and so people didn't like it. Some installation shots of this show. It was kind of the Smithsonian version. You can see nobody's in the gallery, but they probably photographed it beforehand. You know, kind of an oppressive photograph of um, Malcolm X. And so there were reviews of it. Both these shows were reviewed in a photo magazine, and the review was, can Whitey do a beautiful black picture show? And their answer was no, because they had Roy de Carava, a 
preeminent um, African-American photographer at the time who's out protesting in front of the Metropolitan Museum of Art that they didn't include people like him, which they should have. And um, so he writes part of this review about how bad the Metropolitan show is. And then a, a woman named Marjorie Mann was very critical of the Panther show of Ruth Marion Baruch's and Perkles because she thought it didn't show the violent aspect of that. Now, at the same time that this show is being criticized in New, in New York at the Met, the Harlem on my mind, Perkle and Ruth Marion's show is up at the Harlem Studio Museum of Harlem, and that's not criticized at all by the black community. So you think, God, here are two white photographers in a black uh, venue, and that is completely accepted. In this review, Perkle realized that Marjorie Mann was going to do this in the review, and so they had this disclaimer, and it says, a regretful note, on learning that Marjorie Mann, who was going to review the Black Panther show exhibit, Perkle Jones phoned to forbid us to publish any of the photograph, Ruth Marion's photographs or Perkle's photographs in the magazine. And um, he, uh, Perkle said in his own way, and I don't know if anyone here, um, Susanna knows Perkle, but in his own way he said, uh, we don't think she's a very good critic. And that's how, that's how Perkle, that was it. You know, Perkle wasn't going to elaborate, and so that was it. And so the people at the, at, at the photo magazine were upset that this one's going to happen. And so they took, instead of, they couldn't show this photograph, which is what they wanted to show, and so they did a drawing. And they did this instead and said, here's the, here's the photo, here's essentially it. Um, after this, the Panthers were, you know, a couple years after this show, the Panthers were destabilized by the early 1970s, a few years after the De Young exhibition. The Nixon administration with John Mitchell as Attorney General, as you, some of you may have remembered, joined J. Edgar Hoover's FBI's counterintelligence program and local police to infiltrate and harass and, and, and attack Panthers across the country, as you know as well as anybody. Um, and they jailed them. They, you know, they, uh, the Panthers essentially either went into ex, a lot of them went into exile, they went to jail, they were killed, or they killed each other. They set them up in some respects where they thought people were infiltrators, and they set them up and they'd wind up killing each other in some respects. Um, numerous times the FBI would visit Perkle and Ruth Marion in Mill Valley. They'd go over to this house that was way up in the top of Mount Tam, this beautiful house, and they'd pester them about what kind of correspondence they'd received or what kind of, you know, knowledge they might have of Panthers. Um, the Vanguard was published by Beacon Press in 1923, and they showed uh, the photographs, many of the 123 photographs that were shown in the, at the De Young. Perkle winds up teaching for a second time at the Art Institute beginning in 1972, where he teaches until the mid-1990s. There's Perkle on the roof of the school. And he takes a cue from Ruth Marion, and he does his own photographic series on hippies, this time the counterculture vagabonds that lived at Gate 5 on the houseboats at Sausalito, if there was anybody here from Sausalito and lived on Gate 5. Some of those photographs from that time period. And he embeds himself with that situation. I mean, look how crazy that looks. And one of the people who lived at Gate 5 at that time was David Johnson. So Perkle crossed paths with David again. Ruth Marion continued to photograph the Panthers. She photographs, she goes to San Quentin, and she photographs George Jackson and Fleet of Drum going at San Quentin Prison. Ruth Marion died in 1997. A collection of her poetry was published in 2002, which gives a whole lot of clues into her early life, her relationship with her mother, her severe bouts with the Depression, her shock treatment that she had in the 1950s up at Napa State, and the, what she would call her conspicuous pain. And, and she alluded to Edward Weston in some of those poems. Perkle's long overdue appreciation culminated in a, a monograph that was published by Aperture, Aperture in 2001. And then the Black Panther photographs were republished by Grey Bull Press in 2002 in this book. Um, and then in 2013, the Perkle Jones Trust published this book, Black Power, Flower Power, which is a um, great tribute to Ruth Marion Baruch, who was involved with both those projects. Um, and copies of it are here, actually, tonight, if anybody's interested in taking a look at them or purchasing it from the people who brought them. Um, and then you come up to today. Forgive me. I, I'm a librarian, so I, I have the license to read at any kind of presentation, I think. But um, the next couple of photographs here are by a current San Francisco Art Institute student. 
and his, his name is Wassam Abudrai. And it's of, the, it's of this current world doing the same thing that Perkle Jones did and Ruth Marion Baruch did. These are two um, uh, Black Lives Matter people at the Oakland airport who are reading off a list of names. And I, I, I think things are better now, but I, I know there's a whole lot more that needs to be done. And you can tell that from some, a couple of these images. You know, Trayvon Martin, Oscar Grant, Michael Brown, Eric Garner, Tamir Rice, Walter Scott, Freddie Gray, Sandra Bland, Samuel Dubois, Mario Woods, Ferguson, Baltimore, North Charleston, Staten Island, Walker County, Texas, Cincinnati, Oakland, San Francisco. You know, these are real people in real places. And there's some fictitious places that sure needs a lot of change too, like, you know, the Academy Awards in some respects too. So, you know, it's not like everything has ended, but, you know, and there's no, there's no, I don't think there's any great need really to exactly replicate historic models of resistance, but it is a valuable exercise to look back at these elders for, for guidance, I think, in lots of ways, whether it's the community grassroots efforts of the Black Panther Party for self-defense, or whether it's the role of whites attached to those struggles for justice epitomized by Perkle Jones and Ruth Marion Baruch, and by people today doing those kinds of things. So thank you for coming to the San Francisco Public Library and their books back here, and I appreciate you sitting through all this. And a question. <laughs>